Good morning, wise women. Thanks so much for being here. We're excited to bring you Dr. Stacy Close this morning. I just have two announcements and one is not to forget the food for Mercy Learning Center. Come to 597 Westport Avenue, drop it off or call me and I'll come to you and get it. And please think about the fact that we do, we are looking for someone to head up our nominating committee to find a publicity person in the interim. We have reached out and been successful with Dan Woog, 06880, the Hearst Publications Newstime.com, the Westport Local Press, that's also online, and Norwalk Patch. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to our Margaret. Okay. Welcome, everybody. We're pleased to have today our next virtual meeting with uh, Dr. Stacy Close as our presenter. Um, Dr. Close is the Associate Provost and the Vice President for Equity and Diversity at Eastern Connecticut State University. He's also an accomplished historian who's published and given presentations at various professional organizations and achieved many awards, including NAACP Award for the 100 Most Influential People in Connecticut and uh, Teaching Awards and fellowship at the American Council of Education. Uh, his work as an historian has allowed him to provide some information about the great migration that occurred in the US. And today he's going to describe that, uh, especially as it applies to the state of Connecticut. And we usually think of that as other parts of the country, but as we learn today, it actually had a, a very big effect here in Connecticut. So. Welcome, Dr. Close, and we look forward to what you have to say. Now, let me first thank um, Barbara and Margaret and the Fairfield uh, Y Women for the opportunity to speak today, and also um, Bruce Colgate for his help uh, on the technical side. Um, let me talk a little bit about how I came to this topic, first of all. Uh, in part, uh, this particular topic, uh, came about because of students uh, that I had in my class uh, some years ago, African American history class, who asked me about the place of Connecticut uh, in terms of large movements uh, like the Great Migration. And so that's how I began. Uh, and I talk about 1915 to 1970 and what happens with this more than 6 million people who, who make the migration of which people from Connecticut are part of it. Uh, anytime um, I do a discussion on migration uh, or African American history in general, I like to begin uh, as uh, Dr. Carter Woodson, the father of black history would say, uh, he said all discussions should in essence begin uh, with Africa. Now, the world of Africa, of course, was in 1400, not only immense, but it was also a world of great empires from Mali uh, Songhai and Ghana and others. Uh, but it was also a world that where it would have where eventually um, Venture Smith uh, would uh, be captured uh, sometime in the 18th century uh, and then uh, brought aboard ship and then sold uh, into slavery after being kidnapped. Uh, but as it says here, through his industry, he would acquire his freedom and money uh, to purchase his freedom. Uh, he will die in the 77th year of his life. And he would be referred to in many cases as Connecticut's Paul Bunyan. Now, as important as uh, his, his life was to Southeastern Connecticut, the African presence uh, was virtually um, uh, everywhere throughout the state of Connecticut in the colonial period. Uh, you could find the African presence in the burial ground uh, where some 300 African people were found by students uh, from Weaver High School. Uh, you could also find the African presence eventually as the nation in the colonial period begins uh, to um, become a nation and fight for its own freedom. As the colonists fight for their own freedom, there is an African presence there uh, in the life of people like Lemuel Haynes of West Hartford, uh, who becomes not only a soldier, but after the war, uh, he becomes a minister um, in Vermont, a pastor in Vermont. Uh, he will teach school in Connecticut for a short period in time. 
Along with this, by the 19th century, African-American women, people like Sojourner Truth and Maria Stewart, they become powerful voices, not only for women, but also for the eradication of the institution of slavery. Sojourner Truth will live for a period in time with the Shakers uh, in Enfield. Maria Stewart was born in West Hartford. Now, when it came to the institution of slavery, slavery, of course, was a part of New England, uh, as uh, Dr. Carter Woodson pointed out, and also as far as Lorenzo Green pointed out in his Negro and Colonial New England. But it would be Deacon James Mars, who was born in 1799 in Norfolk, uh, he would be born into slavery, eventually get his freedom and become deacon of what is now uh, Faith Church in Hartford. He would find himself embroiled in the 19th century in a case whereby which an enslaved woman, Nancy, would be brought from Georgia to Hartford. And then abolitionists and anti-slavery factions like Deacon James Mars would fight and argue for her freedom. And as a result of that, he would receive death threats in the process. Part of the freedom struggle for African-Americans, of course, meant the building and the organizing of churches, places like Faith Church and Metropolitan AME Zion Church, just some examples from, from the world of Hartford. But you would also find in the 19th century, you will find powerful figures like Prudence Crandall and Sarah Harris. Uh, both would be important in terms of of fighting for the freedom of, of, of Black people, particularly when it comes to Crandall and young Black women who wanted an education. They would struggle against the Black law, but they would also, uh, particularly the family of Sarah Harris and others, they would provide a place for runaways, for fugitives uh, in the area around Jail Hill uh, in the Norwich, Connecticut area. But for African-Americans in the 19th century, uh, their lives were very tenuous. Um, in, when it came to issues of owning property and voting. Uh, in 1814, William Lanson and Bias Stanley, two African-Americans from New Haven, protested and argued for no taxation without representation. In 1818, Connecticut's constitution restricted suffrage to only adult might white men who were aged 21 and owned property uh, worth at least $7. Between 1838 and 1850, African-Americans in Connecticut offered to the state legislature some 26 sets of papers arguing for the franchise. And so you would find that in terms of the struggle for freedom for African-Americans, particularly when it came to the right to vote, the right to own property, the right to move where you wanted to move to, to a certain extent, it would be limited. And the vote would not come until 1865. But my focus is migration, particularly 20th century migration. But what I wanted uh, folks to know was that there was a migration that occurred all throughout the 19th century, spurred as the great historian um, Carter G. Woodson and John, and John Hope Franklin both would say, uh, by the presence of the Underground Railroad that would touch Connecticut. Uh, a perfect example of someone who is a part of this struggle is the Reverend James Pennington. Uh, he became a Hartford pastor, but he was born into slavery in Maryland and then moved from there uh, through the Underground Railroad and of his own volition to freedom. He was initially uh, almost captured by slave catchers somewhere near the Pennsylvania border, uh, but he used his, his brain uh, to set himself free from slave catchers. He said to them quite wisely, I have smallpox, and they knowing that there were a group of enslaved people nearby where smallpox had been had infested them, they decided to let him go. Uh, with the help of Quakers, with the help of other whites who were part of the Underground Railroad, he would make his way on into New York and eventually study um, for the ministry uh, and for a time even uh, attend classes at Yale. Uh, but from there, uh, his ministry would eventually by the 1840s take him into Hartford, where he would become a driving force in helping the eventual freedom of the very famous Amistad people who had battled and fought for their freedom in 1839. In addition to that, there are stops on this Underground Railroad that we know quite a lot about in places like Bloomfield, Connecticut. There are stops in Manchester. And there are also stops in the eastern portion of our state in Brooklyn, Connecticut, that are part of the Underground Railroad. 
And then there is the, um, the, the stop uh, in Deep River. Uh, one of the runaways who made his way from South Carolina to Deep River was a man by the name of William Winters. Uh, he was born Daniel Fisher, uh, but he changed his name to, to, to uh, William Winters and made it to the Black community of Deep River, where he was able to live and reside uh, for a, a period in time uh, amongst the free Black population there. Now, Deep River has an interesting history because in part, um, it is also directly tied to the ivory trade. Uh, Deacon George Reed and some of the other powerful white ministers uh, and lay people in the area, uh, they were able uh, to uh, lead a, a charge to end slavery. But around ivory, uh, around Deep River, ivory was very important uh, because it helped to spur on the industry that was based on ivory an industry that was very much uh, aided in the, in the world of Africa in the 19th and early 20th century by slave labor. But by the time you get to 1861, uh, the nation of course is at war, uh, the American Civil War. It will not be until after 1863 that African-American men become a part of that fighting force. And Connecticut's 29th would be part of that. These are African-American men um, some from Connecticut, others from the Upper South who make up this 29th Regiment. Uh, the most famous battle probably that, in, that the 29th was involved in was the Great Siege or battle at, at Petersburg in, in 1864. But as the, as, the, as, the, as the war eventually wound down and the North won, from 1865, really until around 1877, the nation would enter a period of history called Reconstruction. Uh, it's during the period of Reconstruction where there are Black elected politicians, uh, people like Joseph Rainey, who was elected in South Carolina. Rainey will eventually become a resident of Windsor, Connecticut, uh, because in the latter portions of Reconstruction, the violence was extreme. And rather than remaining in South Carolina where death might have been possible, he will migrate to Windsor, Connecticut. And there is his house and a, uh, a photo of, of uh, Joseph Rainey. Now, you'll also find that in portions of Connecticut like Putnam, there'll be other African-American migrants as well. People like Thomas L. Taylor, uh, who was an African-American Union Civil War sailor uh, above the um, ironclad monitor during the Civil War. Along with that, there'll be other people uh, like uh, the husband of Lucretia West. West was born uh, in, in Putnam, but she, she married a man uh, who had migrated from the South. Uh, and this is after the period of, of slavery. So this migration uh, that is so much a part of the 20th century was also part of the 19th century. And here is the interesting story of Felicia Terry. Uh, in 1908, she was a student teacher at what is known as Willimantic Normal. And Terry would go on, she is the daughter of a migrant, uh, a former enslaved man from Virginia who migrates to Connecticut, marries a, a Pequot woman, and from that union, uh, Felicia Terry is born. Uh, she will go on to be a teacher in Brooklyn, Connecticut, and will actually write um, one of the first histories of Brooklyn, Connecticut. Now, one of the people who helps to shape migration uh, is Booker T. Washington, the legendary principal, uh, teacher and educator at Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. It will be Washington who, while he will travel to Connecticut and not necessarily be a migrant, but his ideas about black leadership, black uplift, they will migrate as well. It will be Washington who will urge blacks all over the country, not just in the South, to pull themselves up by their bootstraps to build businesses and build organizations. One of the most powerful organizations was his National Negro Business League. And the idea catches on in Connecticut under the leadership of G. Grant Williams. He not only runs his own barbershop, but he also has his own bookstore, where, as uh, the slide shows, uh, he sells high-class Negro literature, as he called it from that day. 
Then there are others who are part of this migration. Uh, Frank uh, Pierce Chisholm, uh, who is a uh, migrant from South Carolina. One of the things Booker T. Washington was well known for, for his school was fundraising, but he wasn't alone in that process. Who helped him in that process was uh, Frank Pierce Chisholm. Outside of Washington, uh, during the early period, he was probably uh, the um, best known fundraiser for Tuskegee, but he married his, marries into the family of Anna Louisa James, uh, who is a pharmacist in, in Old Sabro. And Mrs. James becomes a pharmacist in 1917. In fact, uh, pharmacy was in the blood of many of her family members, uh, and they were quite prominent in, 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 the, in the pharmacy trade. Now, then there is uh, George Williamson Crawford, Esquire. Uh, he is an Alabama native and a student of Booker T. Washington, but he will graduate from Tuskegee Institute and then go on to graduate from Yale Law School, enters private practice, becomes, and a, becomes a corporate counsel for New Haven from 1954 to 1962. But one of the things that will impact the Black community, both North as well as South, is the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson case. That particular case, as far as the South, it draws a color line all throughout the South. That color line uh, will be uh, established during the time of Chief Justice Melville uh, Weston Fuller. But one of the, um, the cases that they drew upon to establish this separate but equal system in the South was Roberts versus the school board of Boston, Massachusetts of 1855. That particular school case uh, would serve as precedence for the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson case. That's Homer Plessy on the left here. Now, what does a color line mean? It means in essence that in terms of the right to vote all over the South, blacks would be systematically and legally uh, denied the right to vote even though some had voted based on the 15th Amendment during the period of Reconstruction, you will eventually get the grandfather clause and also the poll tax that will halt the ability of many African-Americans and, and Blacks in the South to vote. You'll also have things like the literacy test that will further strengthen the color line as far as political power uh, of Blacks throughout the South. Along with that, there is also the coming of sharecropping, or as some historians would say, neo-slavery, where you work for a share of the crop, but not really money. And sharecropping will basically bound people to the land um, as a result. And for those who are not bound to the land by sharecropping, um, any small crime might see you become part of the convict, convict lease system whereby which you would be leased out as workers uh, in mines in North Georgia, uh, in mines in portions of Alabama and, and Tennessee, and where you would labor uh, until you could labor no more. Now, along with the convict lease system, the period of Jim Crow and the period uh, after Plessy versus Ferguson is also a period of increasing violence and increasing violence in Habersham County, Georgia, increasing violence uh, in the area around Sylvester, Georgia, where lynchings became quite prominent during the period. Now, what's important about the points that I make about the Southern violence, the lack of political opportunity, the lack of economic opportunity, these are push or pull factors that will lead to the, uh, to the great migration of World War I. Now, Emmett J. Scott, who was Booker T. Washington's loyal secretary, he said that the first wave of the Great Migration was to Connecticut. Now, he makes that argument, other scholars uh, and noted figures say it was to Chicago. But the migration to Connecticut is driven in large part by economics, but all the other factors play a part, education, et cetera. Now, in the map here, you see the areas in black. Those are some of the areas that are hardest hit by the migration from 1915 to 1920. And one of the people who helps to spur on the migration to Connecticut is Morehouse President John Hope. Um, 
it was John Hope after hearing from the National Urban League and the National Urban League is asked by the Connecticut Tobacco Growers Association to help them find additional workers after they had attempted uh, to um, locate workers in New York uh, to work tobacco and it just didn't pan out. So as a result, uh, they turn to black college presidents and John Hope will travel to Connecticut to sign up uh, 20 or more of the young Morehouse men to work tobacco. Those young men um, are shown here uh, in, a, in a newspaper article from 1916. And so you have them along with people from the New York age that also helps to drive the migration as well. Now, when I mentioned economics, uh, in Connecticut, if you were a tobacco worker, you could get 33 and a half cents a bundle versus 12 and a half cents a bundle in Florida. So uh, what better better reason than to, to head to Connecticut uh, than their, their economic opportunity? And plus, unlike many sharecroppers, you, you did receive your wages every week. Now, the migration will also foster an increase in monthly wages in rural areas near Albany, Georgia in 1917. Wages rose from eight to ten dollars a month to twenty to thirty dollars a month, and it will also this period of migration. It will also be a period where you see the rise of prominent African American women in Connecticut. One example uh, is that of Mary Townsend Seymour. Uh, she not only advocated for the uh, passage of the Nineteenth Amendment, but she would also um, in 1917 and 1918, uh, she will decide to begin to work towards the creation of an, a chapter of the NAACP. And in fact, in 1917, uh, she will write to W.E.B. Du Bois, author of The Souls of Black Folk, who knew about migration. Uh, she would ask that he come to Connecticut. Uh, because she feared that there was an attempt to segregate Black children from the South, uh, put them in school at night away from other, other children. That effort, uh, that, that call she put forward, will lead to, to the formation of what is now the Greater Hartford NAACP. But the NAACP's development in Connecticut really begins uh, in 1917 throughout the state. Uh, I think first in New Haven and then uh, the, the Hartford chapter. But she wrote not only in the Crisis magazine, uh, she also wrote in the newspaper uh, in 1912 and 1914. That's Mary Townsend Seymour on the left. Now, the migration will also bring individuals like Bosch Barlow, uh, who was brought as a six month old from America's Georgia uh, to, to the Hartford area. And his father would eventually get a job in the rubber works and his mother would run a, um, a business while uh, his father worked in the rubber works. Uh, his career will take him on from graduating from Hartford Public High School to Howard University to Harvard Law School. And he will become a, a gold star family member and also a veteran uh, of the war um, serving in New Guinea. Now, Connecticut's tobacco fields, uh, as far as migration, would also see prominent figures, people like Thurgood Marshall, people like Mahalia Jackson, and also people like Hattie McDaniel and tennis great Arthur Ashe, who are part of this migration into Connecticut's tobacco fields. But the tobacco fields, they opened up opportunity in other places like the Hartford Rubber Works uh, in the 1920s. Southern migrants were able to find work in the Hartford Rubber Works. They were able to find work in the lumber yards. If they were around New Haven, there was possibility around the, uh, the wharfs and the docks and places like that for, for work opportunity. And there were also jobs um, uh, inside uh, some of the, uh, the college and university campuses. Uh, private colleges and university campuses as well that you found outside of tobacco. Now, the migration will lead to population growth. From 1910 to 1930, 
uh, there is almost a, a 14, there's more than a 14,000 uh, population increase for African Americans in Connecticut. And much of that is spurred on by the migration, by an opportunity that the economics of World War I opened up. And that migration even continues on throughout the period of the Great Depression. Now, religion is also a factor in migration. Two examples here. The Mount Calvary Baptist Church and the Mount Olive Baptist Church were both founded in Connecticut in 1917. These are two transplanted churches where in essence, populations from South Georgia basically pick up congregations and they move in large numbers to Connecticut because work is available. And so when they make that move, they have an opportunity to um, find not only work, but also to create uh, religious worship like they were used to in the South. Now, that migration even covers Willimantic, Connecticut. The migrants who formed the Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Hartford, they will find found the Calvary Baptist Church of Willimantic in the 1930s. And those folks who migrated to Willimantic, they migrated uh, from the South on from Hartford on into Willimantic because they could find jobs at American Thread. Now, in some cases though, there were some established churches that opened their doors to migrants. Uh, here's an example of Union Baptist Church whose roots go back before World War I, um, back to uh, 1871 as, as a matter of fact, and to uh, Essex County, Virginia, and then on to, to Hartford. Now, one of the more prominent early family members uh, of this church was a Waring family, I, and I, I looked them up just to see um, how many uh, Warings there were after uh, the uh, Civil War of 1870 in Essex County, and there were about 90. Um, but they made their way through the railroads and they became the first wave of, of people from um, Virginia, Essex County, Virginia, to make it to, to this area. Uh, and one of the early founders was Eugene Waring, who uh, was a shad fisherman along with his, his family members. Now, one of the more interesting figures who are part of this migration is Reverend C.L. Fisher and his wife, Rosa Fisher. The Fisher family uh, migrated from Alabama. He's initially a, um, a native of Louisiana, but his wife and children are, are all natives of, of Alabama. Uh, he will publicly announce that due to migration, uh, he hoped to, to um, purchase new property because his church's size had doubled uh, in eight months. They had added 190 members. Now, Fisher welcomed these, these folks from the South, uh, but he was also a strong race man. Uh, and what I mean by a strong race man, uh, he spoke out against race riots, um, like the East St. Louis race riot of 1917, and he, he vehemently condemned it. Uh, he condemned race riots in Washington, D.C. in 1919. But he is also the former pastor of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. He actually established that church, moved to Connecticut in 1916, and then returned in 1921. This is the famous 16th Street Baptist Church uh, that was a huge part of the 19. 63 uh, Birmingham movement and, and served as the movement church uh, in 1963. Now, World War I also saw African-American men, just like uh, other men in the country, uh, being drafted into service. And here are a group of uh, draftees from, from World War I. And there they are uh, marching down Main Street. Now, migration, also sees some changes in terms of education. Uh, in the early part of the 19th century, uh, during the days of James Pennington, uh, where black schools existed throughout the state, they were usually tied to, to churches. Uh, that's in any city, in any town. Um, but those churches were established and, and led primarily by church people. Um, in terms of schools, it's really not uh, until 
after uh, the uh, the period of reconstruction that you get the hiring of black teachers in public schools, uh, such as the case with the hiring of Edith Taylor in 1929 in Hartford. Her hiring is directly tied to a visit uh, to the city by U.S. Representative Oscar de Priest. Now, you also find that there are educators uh, who come along later, like M. Beatrice Wood. Now, M. Beatrice Wood was hired as a Hartford educator in 1948, but her husband wasn't hired until 1954. Uh, the same year of the famous Brown decision, because there was a fear of black male teachers in, in, in the greater Hartford region. As far as Groton, uh, Groton hired Barbara Elaine uh, to be a teacher uh, in the, um, the, 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 um, the 1950s. Uh, she had been educated at Fisk University, and in the 1940s, uh, for the vast majority of African Americans who got college education, they usually traveled south to Fisk or Howard and then came back uh, to, uh, to work in Connecticut, no matter uh, what city or town you were talking about. Uh, you also have uh, other migrants like Dr. A. Doris Henrys, who was born in 1913 in Live Oak, Florida, and her family came northward. Uh, she would graduate from Willamette, normal, earn her master's and doctoral degree, uh, at Columbia, uh, become a principal in, in South Carolina, and then become prominent in terms of the education uh, and, and government in Liberia. Uh, she would actually marry the Speaker of the House of Liberia. And for uh, A. Doris Henrys, she would find herself back in Middletown in 1981 um, because of the, um, the famous coup uh, by Samuel K. Doe uh, in Liberia. You'll also find that migration also saw the birth and the growth of the movement of Marcus Garvey's uh, in Connecticut. Garvey chapters could be found in Hartford, New Haven, East Granby, Berlin, and Portland. These chapters are directly tied to migration because there were actually more Garvey chapters in the South than the North. And a number of the people who joined the Garvey movement in Connecticut, they already knew about it in the South. So when they came up, it was just a common thing to, to, to be part of that movement for those who had already been a part of the movement. Now, one of the things that happens during the, the Great Depression is that it becomes the Great Leveler. And what I mean by the Great Leveler, it brings all people in society down just a bit. Uh, but Connecticut will suffer greatly, particularly Connecticut's uh, more urbanized areas. It's not uncommon to find that the unemployment rate for Blacks during the Great Depression, uh, particularly around 1938, could be as high as 50% of people who were actually looking for jobs. This is just a slide of some children uh, who were um, uh, left homeless because of the hurricane of, of 38. Now, one of the interesting things about migration is that certain states will populate more cities uh, that, than others. For what I mean by that, if you take the folks from Gee's Bend, Alabama, they brought with them their love of quilting and their major destination from anybody from Gee's Bend, Alabama was Bridgeport. For the folks who migrated from Southwest Georgia, their primary focus was finding a way to get to the Hartford area. When you looked at places like Waterbury, the vast majority of migrants to Waterbury, they hailed from, from North Carolina. New Haven, it's pretty much uh, Virginia and North Carolina migrants. New London, it's primarily Georgia migrants. Now, one of the things that happens after World War II is that migration continues and business growth begins to open up. And I'll show you some examples that for time's sake, um, I'll focus primarily on the Hartford area. Now, during World War II, uh, you have uh, uh, Connie Napier, who's a Tuskegee Airman and who's a migrant from Eastman, Georgia. Uh, you also have Captain Lemuel Custis, who's one of the earliest Tuskegee Airmen. 
Um, he had been a Hartford police officer. He had learned to fly out at Bradley Field. Uh, and his father was a migrant from Virginia, uh, moving from Virginia to Connecticut, spending some time, his father at least, uh, in Massachusetts, and then heading back uh, to Aetna, where he became uh, a secretary at Aetna Life and Insurance. But both men uh, will um, become major historical figures. Uh, as far as the war, uh, Custis will fly more than 80 combat missions uh, during World War II as one of the uh, famous Tuskegee Airmen. You'll also have women uh, from Connecticut who are also part of the war effort. Uh, Private First, First Class Mary Barlow, uh, who had once worked at Underwood Typewriter. She will die in the um, World War II war zone in France when a vehicle she was riding in uh, hit an explosive and she would be killed. Uh, but it just shows you that the impact that um, people will have in terms of, of the war. Now, the migration also opened up jobs in the 1940s. You had places like chicken plants that opened up jobs to African-Americans. Major department stores uh, throughout Connecticut opened up employment to African-Americans. Probably the most famous uh, that opened its doors early in the 1940s was G. Fox Department Store. You also find that African-Americans created a, um, a, a, a daily newspaper called the New England Bulletin. The Bulletin welcomed stories on legendary figures like Lena Horne. It also um, applauded uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work of Ernie Durham and the emergence of bebop. And you also find that migrants will operate businesses like hotels. They'll operate gasoline stations. And they'll also serve as physicians at hospitals all throughout the state. And where there was where it was needed, they also opened up Grace grocery stores that catered to Southern clientele, like McIver's Grocery. You'll also find that they also brought together people uh, from uh, the same institution to build businesses. Uh, the uh, Tuskegee Group opened an institution run and established just by graduates of Tuskegee Institute, Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. Uh, there were also a ser other service stations. There were beauty salons. Early Nelson owned uh, boutiques in both Hartford uh, as well as New Britain. And you also had dry cleaning uh, as well. Record shops existed all throughout the sh state run by blacks. And you had the famous subway uh, in Hartford that was both banquet, billiard hall, and as well as a restaurant. And then you had the Grady Brothers Ambulance Service uh, that were run that was run by Herman and Howard Grady. Both men were, were corpsmen during World War II. And once they got out of service, they opened a floral business. And then after the circus fire of 1944, they decided to go into the ambulance business. Their ambulance service became, uh, years later, the Aetna Ambulance Service. Now, in terms of travel, even as late as the 1940s, for migrants who traveled, they had to know where to stop. And one of the ways you know where to stop is by reading the Green Book. The Green Book gave you stops in uh, where, you could, where you could stay in Bridgeport, where you could stay in Hartford, where you could stay in New Haven, uh, in New London, and, and Stanford. And so it, it lets you know where there were safe places safe places run by black as well as, uh, as white uh, business owners. And one of the places that was a safe haven stop for travelers who needed nightly lodging was 2016 Main Street. 2016 Main Street was actually a funeral home, but it's not uncommon in the 40s for funeral directors to also sell rooms to travelers, both north as well as south. And there are also pharmacies, places like the Ford and James Pharmacy, uh, run by Al Ford and, and Horace James, the same James family that's connected to um, Anna Louisa James from 1917. 
And then there is uh, the, the life of Mary Parkman Watson, who's a migrant from Georgia, but she becomes a powerful Democratic Party leader, not just um, locally, but also throughout the entire state. Uh, she wielded a tremendous amount of power. Uh, and she was also a fantastic uh, uh, chorale uh, director and organizer, organizing a famous gospel convention that brought the great gospel singer Thomas Dorsey of a precious Lord fame uh, to the state. Now, in 1943, uh, the state established the Interracial Commission, now the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. Under the leadership of Reverend um, and Dr. John Jackson, Rabbi Morris Silverman and others, this commission um, allowed citizens to bring forward lawsuits of racial discrimination, and particularly in terms of hiring um, that, that existed in the state at the time. The Reverend Dr. John Jackson was a migrant from South Carolina, uh, and he will establish permanent residence in the state in 1922. But it would be his attack aboard a train uh, that would be one of the catalysts uh, for the com interracial commission. That attack occurred uh, somewhere uh, near t the Tennessee and Alabama line. Now, jazz music was brought north as well, but it was brought north uh, and also uh, found an established place. Uh, people like uh, Arthur Prysock, he played music uh, and joined his, his voice with that of Count Basie. You would also find that there were others uh, who um, made stops in Hartford, people like Dizzy Gillespie, uh, and also uh, Hartford's own Bessie Prophet. But this migration also brought people who were involved in the community. Walter Doc Hurley, uh, who, whose family came from Albany, Georgia, and he would go back down south uh, and get his education at an HBCU then come back and work at Northwest uh, School and then uh, Weaver High School and would become a strong advocate for the education of, of young people in the Hartford area. But one of the migrants uh, from New Jersey is the legendary Paul Robeson. Uh, in 1941, he and his wife and family um, bought a home in Enfield, Connecticut. And they would reside there for a number of years. And then in 1952, Robeson decides to give a concert for the People's Party. Now, the People's Party um, uh, was considered to be the Communist Party. Now, the school board in Hartford had to vote whether or not to allow the infield resident to, to give the concert. The school board voted six to three to allow the concert in 1952. Fearing that there might be violence, the local police called out some 250 officers for 600 concert goers. Uh, the lone African-American member of the school board in glasses there uh, seated uh, was the Reverend Robert Moody. He voted to have the concert. He had known Rowan since the 1940s and actually had welcomed him to Connecticut. Now, 1940, the 1940s also saw for many migrants and anybody who wanted to see them, uh, famous people like Cab Calloway. You could go to the state theater, you could enjoy a, a show for a minimal amount in 1946. But it was also Calloway who also uh, worked to support the NAACP in Connecticut, voicing his, uh, his opinion that they should be supported in terms of their drive to have additional voters. Now, migration at the national level also saw the emergence of Harry Pace uh, and his Northeast Life Insurance and the Black Swan Records. And he would build his records through the voices of people like Fletcher Henderson on the right. You could also see the Ink Spots, Ella Fitzgerald, Buddy Marlow, Morrow and his band uh, at the State Theater as well. But you'll also find that migration will bring Jackie Robinson to Connecticut. Robinson was initially born in near the small village of Cairo, Georgia. 
but his mother by 1919 will take them to Pasadena. Robinson's career will take him through college baseball, college football, uh, and eventually to the Negro Leagues, a uh, stint in basketball. But it would also tie him to the struggle for civil rights in Connecticut. Uh, he would become a powerful voice during his time in baseball and after he left the Brooklyn Dodgers for the rights of Blacks. And one of the people who recognized that was policewoman Ella Baker. Uh, she was uh, Connecticut's first Black policewoman. And she also uh, wanted to build a community center in Hartford. And so she connected up with Stanford's Jackie Robinson in an effort to try to do that. Now, migrants also brought their love of the outdoors and sports. They brought their love of fishing. They brought their love of hunting. They brought their love of baseball. And they also brought their love of golf. What I discovered was that a number of the men that I interviewed who, who grew up in the 40s and 50s, uh, some had caddied as golfers in the South. And they brought their love of golf to the north, to Connecticut. And they created uh, a uh, black golf club called Midway Golf. And one of the um, leaders and presidents of, golf, of the golf, Midway Golf is Gerard Peterson. And as I mentioned, they also brought their, their cultural love. Uh, I, I showed you the, the quilting from Guy's Bend, but there was also quilting going on in Hartford around the same time. Now, as the civil rights movement geared up, you'll find that people like Constance Baker Motley, who was from New Haven, she would become key uh, as an attorney for migrants and folks from Connecticut who were part of the movements in Albany, part of the movements in Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, and she would aid and abed a number of these migrants when they had legal troubles in the South. And then there was Malcolm X. Now, Malcolm X is born in Omaha, Nebraska, but his father's side of the family, they were born in Georgia. And so when he comes to Connecticut in 1954, he finds family members living in public housing in Hartford. He also connects with migrants in Bridgeport and New Haven as well. And if you read his autobiography, he talks about the connections that he will make uh, with migrants as he, um, he builds up the number of mosques inside the nation of Islam. And he also talks about a, um, a, a, um, a car accident that um, is caused by a, a leading Connecticut politician um, that he writes about in his book as well. That's kind of interesting. Now, as far as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he will first come to Connecticut in 1944. And Coretta Scott King writes about his time uh, in Connecticut in her My Life with Martin Luther King Jr. And she says it has a profound impact on his life. Uh, he works for the um, Cullen Brothers tobacco camp uh, in Simsbury in 44 and 46. Uh, he will make several trips to Connecticut, lecturing at the University of Hartford, also giving lectures at Wesleyan University, and he will make other visits in 62 and 64 and 66. One of his best friends was the, uh, the Reverend Richard Battles, pictured here with him. Now, his call for support and allies in the struggle will we'll also see Connecticut answering that call. But it will also see people uh, having to struggle with attacks. The family of people directly in Birmingham and also children uh, who are in school um, in, in, in Connecticut as well. Um, a Westport student, an African-American student who was going to Staples High School learns uh, that his family's home in Birmingham in 1963 had been bombed. And he responds to that bombing uh, and learns that his family is, is okay. But in terms of his plans, he planned a student plan to be a doctor. And uh, he hoped to return 
to Alabama. Dr. King also influenced college students. When the Birmingham movement began in 1963, students at, at Eastern Connecticut State University, they will in 1963, led by uh, Dr. Arthur Johnson and also uh, uh, Dr. James Tipton, uh, they will lead a, a, a march or a rally in support of Birmingham Blacks. Dr. King will also uh, build friendships with rabbis in Connecticut as well. Uh, such was the case um, in, in Fairfield County with his connection uh, to Temple Israel. And as far as the great movement, the massive march on Washington brought more than 5,000 Connecticut folks. And here are some of them in 1963. It will also be a movement that you see a push to integrate schools in Connecticut. Um, a, um, a young woman by the name of Sylvia Govan and members of NECAP, the North End Community, Act, Community Action Program attempt to um, uh, integrate Noah Webster School in Hartford. Now, in terms of the movement, the movement also saw the support of white business people. Farmington's Richard Alexander Russell, he would provide used cars for the civil rights movement. And one of the people who would come to Connecticut to drive the used cars down to Alabama and down to Mississippi was the, uh, the Reverend Bernard Lafayette. Lafayette worked for both SCLC and SNCC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Violent Coordinating Conference. Now, as far as migrants, migrants also worked to try to give their, their young people activities, such as 1963, um, where you have a young men uh, being taught basketball um, to keep them, to give them something to do during the summer. But the movement also had its tragedy. Uh, Viola Weasel uh, was tragically killed during the Selma campaign of 1965. One of the people that she was helping to shuttle in 1965 as far as shuttling marchers was Leroy Moton. When her car was fired upon, Moton wasn't hit. Uh, the Klansman who fired on the car thought that the blood soaked Moton was dead. He, he pretended to be, to, be, to be dead to save his life. And then he caught a ride uh, back into town and told what had happened to him. But he would move to Connecticut in 1967 for safety. Now, in terms of changes, Project Concern sees the busing of students uh, in Connecticut, the busing of students from the cities out to the suburbs. You also see in 1967 that a wave of rebellion as young people in urban areas called it, or riots as the press called it, began to sweep American cities. They had happened earlier in 65 um, in portions of Watts. They had happened earlier in, in 64 in portions of, of Alabama. But in 1967, uh, the, the roots of the upheaval uh, and rebellion uh, emerged because of a disagreement at a, um, uh, a luncheonette run by Adam Battles. That disagreement um, came as a result of the purchase of a hot dog. The purchase of a hot dog is a catalyst for the riot in, in Hartford and the, a raid on a blind pig is the, the, the catalyst for a riot in, in Detroit. But what young people made very clear was that they couldn't find jobs, many of them. And they also talked about disagreements they had had with business in both black and white, at least in the case of Hartford in 67. But changes were coming. As migration continued, it opened up opportunities. It opened up opportunities as jobs as fire chiefs like that for John Stewart in Hartford and Sanford Anderson in Norwalk. It would also 
allow for a place of pe for people like Dr. Albert S. Beasley, who was a longtime resident of Westport and a physician and a philanthropist. Uh, it would be Beasley uh, who would actually give scholarships to young students um, from high schools in the area who wanted to go on to college. Uh, and he would be uh, one of the few black pediatricians um, in, in the state uh, when he first started. And then there is the, the life work of Dr. Judith Hamer. And one of the reasons I wanted to include her, um, not only because she was a, a professor at NYU and Columbia, but also because uh, she was able to give to the National African American Museum and Cultural Center something of her family to the museum, a photo of one of her relatives, uh, two of her relatives, excuse me, who had been enslaved and also a banner of one of her residents uh, who had attended uh, Cornell uh, University. And you were able to have a part of the county in the National Museum on African American History and Culture. Now, the migration opened doors. Uh, it also caused tensions religiously. Um, it caused tensions as far as work, but it will also have future changes. The future changes will see the election of politicians as mayors that are extremely important, uh, particularly the election of Thurman L. Milner and the election of Carrie Saxon Perry as the first uh, elected female mayor of a city in, in New England. And then there is the out migration and return. The migration story uh, continues because there is now an out migration to the South uh, that began in 1970. The more than 6 million people that will leave during the period of the great migration and afterwards, uh, there is now a return. Some who are still alive have returned, uh, others their children are returning. And the impact of course uh, of that has seen the election of black politicians in places for the first time, like Montgomery, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and other places. And it also had an impact recently on the elections of, of US senators, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff in Georgia as well. Now, migration has allowed for America to change and as it will continue to do so. And with that, I thank you for your time. And I am actually done. Okay, wonderful. Well, we certainly thank you. And the, the first question just asked you to expand on something you described in terms of people migrating to particular cities in um, Connecticut. Okay. Um, one of the things that happens is that labor recruiters will, will um, target um, certain areas of the South. Let me first talk about, about tobacco. Uh, labor recruiters uh, targeted portions of West Florida and Southwest Georgia uh, because one of the best known uh, tobacco um, leaders in Connecticut, Marcus L. Floyd, he hailed from Quincy, Florida. And so he knew Quincy, Florida very well. And so he knew the landowners there. And so he, um, he targeted that area for recruiters. And so once you get people coming, then family members began to encourage other family members to come. Uh, and they will help to set them up with jobs. They say, okay, come, and there are jobs. Now, in the case of, in the case of, of, of Waterbury, uh, what happens for some African-Americans who are migrating to Waterbury, uh, they have been, in some cases, servants for very wealthy whites in Waterbury. And so they come up initially uh, to uh, work, in, a, work in, in the homes of people they work for in the South. Now, the docks in and around portions of New Haven 
they offer opportunity. Uh, because once you have long wharf, uh, ships come in and people see that there's opportunity. And one of the things that happens in Connecticut is that Connecticut's whaling industry will continue on into the 20th century. And a number of black men up and down the seaboard, uh, they see opportunity in that. Uh, hopefully um, that answers a portion of, 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 of your question. Up and down the seaboard, uh, they see opportunity. Yes, that certainly does. Um, we have another, we have time for just a couple questions. So let's try with um, another question about sharecropping. Uh, we're assuming that a number of the migrants in the, particularly the early days of migration have been sharecroppers. Uh, we know that's a tough system for the sharecroppers, but it is advantageous for the landowners. Did the sharecroppers who were moving north or was that something that they, they allowed to happen without any kind of intervention? Not in every case. Uh, some people actually had to steal away. And I'll give you a, a couple of cases from uh, the area around uh, America's Georgia and Thomasville, Georgia. Um, in the area around America's Georgia, when a, a group of blacks attempted to leave America's Georgia, they got arrested um, as a group uh, by the uh, local police force and were held at gunpoint um, and threatened if they boarded the train. The same thing happened to groups of migrants who wanted to leave Thomasville, Georgia they were threatened if they tried to leave. Uh, in the area around Quincy, Florida, uh, white landowners around Quincy, Florida were so disturbed by the migration that they actually went to the uh, capital at Tallahassee and said that they were irate and, and weren't going to allow their workers to leave. Uh, and then they would use force to keep them there. Well, the landowners in and around Tallahassee, Florida took a different tact. They decided they would let the folks who worked for them go as long as they could send um, overseers up with them. And these overseers, they would be uh, the managers of plants uh, and farms in Connecticut. And they would take the wages from black workers to pay for the white overseers to get to Connecticut um, and then return back. And so you would have white managers from the South coming northward. They would oversee the tobacco work. When the work was done, then they were supposed to impose their will and get people to go back. Now, that didn't always work. And I'll give you an example of why it didn't always work. Uh, because some people stayed and some people stayed to the level that the Chamber of Commerce in Terrell County, Georgia, they actually wrote to the Hartford Chamber of Commerce asking that um, an article or an ad be placed in the newspaper saying that the Terrell County, Georgia Chamber of Commerce would pay for the return of anybody, any black worker who wanted to return back to Terrell County, Georgia, because they heard that life was so bad in Connecticut. They didn't get any offers of the return, yeah. but, but they, they did put, put out the, the feeler. Uh, so you have a case of family members, economic recruiting, um, but for those who are recruited, they, they find that one of the big problems was, was housing. Uh, housing was, um, it was a case of overcrowding and a lot of people had to buy or rent houses or apartment larger than what they could afford and then rent out rooms in order to make it. And it was just part of what happened for, for migrants and also part of what happened for immigrants as well. Okay, well, we have time for only one more question. So I think I'll ask something related to the people working on the tobacco farms, because we had a number of questions about that. Um, people are interested in hearing what the life was like for people, in addition to, of course, working in the fields, but were they 
in camps where the employer provided housing and food and so on? And the, the, um, if so, or, and was there any interaction with the local community or did they primarily come and you know work in the field and just stay yeah, on that property? The, the, the employer provided housing. Some of the housing was in tents. Some of the housing was in, actually in barracks as well. Um, many of the camps were segregated camps. You had black workers, um, um, all black workers in some camps. And then some of the camps, uh, there was some integration. Uh, in fact, when Dr. King comes up in 1944 and 46, he talks about interacting with white workers. Uh, and he also talks about going to the Simsbury Congregational Church uh, and being able to sing in the choir. And if he decides to pick up along with friends and go into um, Harford for church, he did talk about one church he visited uh, in Harford, and he talked about visiting the Shiloh Baptist Church. He could do so. And he, they talked about going to the State Theater. Uh, they went out to eat. Um, one of the stops that the uh, migrants liked, um, at least on Windsor Street in Harvard, was a place called the Cozy Spot. Uh, and the Cozy Spot served Southern cuisine. So you could get the same kind of foods you might get in Virginia or Maryland at the Cozy Spot uh, because the owners were Southerners, Black Southerners. And so they they catered to, to that, client, that clientele. But they enjoyed themselves, the young guys, from the colleges. They could go swimming in the Farmington River uh, and they had their own ball games that they created. And so, and they also, um, they, they also, um, in terms of, of, of church services, they wrote about the church services. Now, some of the college students got a little homesick. Uh, in fact, Martin King got homesick and he wrote to his mother that he missed her food. Um, and he asked her for a care package. He asked her to send some of her, her food that she often prepared for him uh, to, to Connecticut. And so wonderful mom that she was, she sent food from Atlanta, Georgia to Connecticut. And he wrote a letter back in terms of what he thought of the food. Well, that's very interesting. Well, we are out of time, I'm afraid. So we could go on and hear lots of other interesting things, but I'm afraid we're going to have to end at this point. So thank you very much, Dr. Close. That was a wonderful presentation, and it really gave us a lot of insight into what happened during that migration period. So thank, thank goodbye to the wise women, and Barbara want to say, uh, say goodbye to the wise women as well, I guess. And we'll, um, you know, we'll... Go Thanks on from much. there. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a good week. Stay well. Enjoy the sunshine.